Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our last day of press conferences here at the EGU 2015. Uh, today's briefing is on recent and future changes in the Greenland Ice Sheet. And taking part in this briefing, we have Christoph van Tricht. He's a, he's a PhD student at the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Leuven in Belgium. Andrew Shepard is a professor of Earth Observation at the University of Leeds in the UK. And Marco Tedesco is an associate professor in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences Department at the City College of New York in the US. And I'll now hand over to our speakers who will give short presentations and then we'll open the floor, the floor for questions. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Christoph van Tricht from the KU Leuven, University of Leuven. And as you can see from uh, the title slide, um, our team has been investigated the, uh, has been investigating the role of clouds in the climate of Greenland, and we found that clouds significantly increase um, mass loss of the ice sheet. So why are we actually interested in clouds over the ice sheet? Well, this is because of the um, very large impact of clouds in the climate system, and this impact is actually twofold. The most obvious role of clouds is their source of precipitation, thereby contributing um, to the surface mass balance of the ice sheet. But on the other hand, clouds also influence um, the energy budget of the surface. And in that, this also affects the surface mass balance. And it's actually the second very important role of clouds that we have been investigated, uh, investigating over the Greenland ice sheet. So how do clouds influence energy? Well, actually, everyone knows the answer to that question. If you would be outside today, you would feel comfortable temperatures, pleasant, and you'd probably be annoyed when a cloud passes by and covers the sun, because you'd feel that the temperatures slightly drop, which is the well-known cooling effect of clouds, because they reflect part of the incoming sunlight, thereby impeding that the sunlight um, increases the heating of the Earth's surface. But on the other hand, if you'd be outside tonight, then you'd feel the reverse. You'd feel that under clear skies, temperatures drop more quickly and just drop more than they would do under a cloudy sky. And it's these two effects together that determine the ultimate impact of clouds on the energy balance. Now we know on a global scale, on, an average, uh, on average, that clouds tend to cool the Earth's surface, but there are many regional differences. And in particular over the Greenland ice sheet, we know that clouds tend to warm the surface, so the warming effect dominates. But because of the limited observations that we have of clouds, because of the remoteness of the area, we just don't know by how much they warm the ice sheet, let alone how this impacts the surface mass balance. Until now, because we have been using state-of-the-art satellite observations together with snow model simulations to assess the impact greenlit-wide of clouds on the surface energy and the mass budget. That means that we don't only look at how the energy changes, but we also make the complex coupling to what it means for the energy budget of the ice. And without further ado, the three most striking numbers that we get from our results are that in the presence of clouds, the Greenland ice sheet surface is on average 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer. Now this might not seem too much, but 1.2 degrees can really make the difference between whether it will melt or not on a substantial part of the ice sheet. And we see that in our results, we see that with clouds, we have an overwhelming 38% more surface melt compared to our simulations without those clouds. And part of this enhanced surface melt, we see that there is an enhanced um, runoff of 12%. And this 12% corresponds roughly to 25 gigatons a year that we lose in excess solely due to the presence of clouds compared to when there would be no clouds over the ice sheet. And then, of course, our results show the uh, extremely large sensitivity of clouds on the surface mass balance. So a logical question would be, well, what about the future? Are, are there going to be more clouds, less clouds? Will this impact increase? Will it decrease? Well, for that, we cannot use observations. We cannot look into the future with observations. So we need climate models for that. And the problem is, we have looked at um, how state-of-the-art climate models simulate clouds over the Greenland ice sheet, and we compared that to our satellite observations of those clouds. 
and we see that this is really problematic. Um, some models have too many clouds, too few clouds, too much liquid, not enough liquid. It's just not okay. Even the state-of-the-art models are really, really struggling with getting these Greenland ice sheet clouds right, which of course questions the reliability of the future projections we have at this point of the future Greenland ice sheet, and of course the subsequent global sea level rise implications of that. So the simple answer to that question is, well, we, don't just, we just don't know what will happen in the future as long as we don't have those improved cloud representations in the models. Which already brings me to the conclusions of our study. With our unique satellite observations combined with snow model simulations, we find that clouds warm the ice sheet surface, they increase ice sheet surface melt, and they enhance the mass loss of the Greenland ice sheet, which directly affects, of course, the global sea level rise. However, we cannot look with our study into the future, but we see that state-of-the-art climate models are not able to properly represent this cloudiness over the ice sheet. So we desperately need improved cloud representations over the ice sheet to get a better insight in the future cloudiness, more clouds, less clouds, higher impact, lower impact, to have a better insight in what eventually will happen on that ice sheet, what the future impact of those clouds will be, and the corresponding contribution to global sea level rise. And with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you. Okay, I'll go now. Okay, my name is Andy Shepard, and I'm presenting this uh, this study um, on behalf of Amber Leeson, uh, formerly my PhD student, now postdoc. Uh, she can't be here today; she's she's somewhere else, unfortunately. She did want to be here, um, and I'm giving this on her behalf. This is her work, and um, it was the topic of her PhD, and now she's working on it uh, in a researcher capacity. Um, she's been looking at lakes that form on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet, and they're really beautiful things. You can see them on Google Earth, or if you fly over, you can see them really pretty. And they do affect the energy balance of the ice sheet. So because they're darker, they attract more heat. Uh, but also, the water tends to um, um, cause other effects on the ice sheet that we now know quite a lot about. So this is a cartoon of, of what Greenland looks like. Um, and on the surface, you can see these lakes, the dark blue areas, around the edge of the ice sheet, which is at relatively low altitudes. And that's where it's warmest. It goes get colder as you go higher to higher altitudes. What we've found, many people have found over the past 10 years or so, is that these lakes form an important part of the hydrological system on Greenland. They store water for a time at the beginning of the melt season, and eventually many of them, most of them in some places, drain, and that water goes somewhere else. Uh, we now know that some of that water drains through the ice sheet and gets to the base of the ice, and eventually it runs into the water, into the sea, but on its way through it can allow the ice to slip on its bed and the ice starts to slide more quickly in some places into the ocean as well. And this is what we call a positive feedback mechanism because uh, the loss of the water can cause additional losses through speeding up of the ice. A lot of work's been done on this and the last, the, the fourth IPCC assessment report, it was uh, raised as a potential threat to future sea level rise because we knew that climate would warm and so this effect could cause the ice sheet to speed up. And the last IPCC assessment report uh, some model simulations were done to try and investigate whether this could cause a sea level rise, and the conclusion was it was only going to be a small effect. What Amber did was she thought about how the lakes might move around the ice sheet over uh, the future, because as climate warms, these lakes will appear in different locations because higher altitudes get warmer. And so she ran this simulation, she built a hydrological model, and she found that the lakes do spread farther inland. So by 2010, they move up. 2020, 30 kilometers further inland, and eventually, by about 2050, in the first study, uh, they spread about 50 to 100 kilometers farther inland. So more of the ice sheet is exposed to this lubrication effect, potentially. That means that the model simulations that were done last time around need to be repeated because they were done with a fixed input of water to the ice sheet, and actually we now know that it evolves over time. So they need to be repeated. It may still be the case that the ice sheet doesn't speed up. It may not be the case, but at the moment we don't really know. It's, a, it's, it's an omitted process. What we've been able to, and so this, this, this plot here shows um, the temporal evolution. It's a 
graph on the x-axis is time, so from 1980 to 2100. And that area that I just showed you is the top curve, and the lakes move to higher altitudes. The y-axis is the altitude. And so by about 2050, lakes are spreading up to about 2,000, 2,200 meters above sea level, quite a lot higher than they are today. In the northeast, Greenland's a lot cooler, and, and we expect uh, lakes to spread, uh, be, be clustered much more closely to the ice sheet margin, and this could be less of an effect. But we couldn't look at that. We couldn't also look at uh, the interior of Greenland as well, because we didn't have a, a good enough model of the surface of the ice sheet, and we couldn't see whether lakes could form in those areas. But we, since then, we've looked at cryosat measurements, which is well designed to look at Greenland, because it has a fine footprint. And it, that's allowed us to both extend these, this, this model of lake spreading to the summit of the ice sheet, which is important because it allows us to run to 2100, not 2060, but also to the northern areas of the ice sheet as well, where the terrain was too rugged. This is a map. It's not showing the lake's locations at the moment. It's showing thinning rate of a, a place in northeast Greenland, Zachary Aristram. And, and the crisis data also show that this, this, this area is thinning really rapidly. It's something that we didn't really know about until now. So it's a surprise. When you look sometimes at the ice sheets, you find things that you didn't know. This, this, part, this, this glacier is now thinning in excess of five metres per year over quite a large area. And so something's happened in the northeast of Greenland, which we used to think was, was a cold area and not very dynamic. Um, it could be that the ocean is triggering this, uh, this glacier to speed up, and it could also be these lakes. So Amber looked at the, she ran her lake model, and there's some lakes around here. So this optical image here is from that section in red. Uh, you can see the lakes uh, on day 299 in 2005, and these lakes drain a few days later, a week later. So there are, this effect does affect this area of Greenland. And at the moment, it's just concentrated down at this downstream edge of the ice sheet, where the, the ice has started thin, in fact. Um, but in the future, she, the, the, the green line here is where the limit of lakes is today. And in the future, we expect it to spread under the 20 or 30, maybe even 50 kilometers farther inland. So exactly the same effect is going to happen in northeast, northeast Greenland as it's going to, is happening today in west central Greenland. So I think that it's really exciting science. Um, and the next step is to build this movement of the lakes into the ice sheet models which are used to make sea level projections. It may not be the case that, that this, this is a threat to sea level rise, but it was mooted in the fourth IPC assessment report that it could cause an extra 20 centimetres of sea level rise. So, so it's definitely something that needs to be investigated. Not exactly on time, but 15 seconds there. That's me then. <laughs> Remember how to use a PC. Mm. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Marco Tedesco. I'm with the City College of New York. Uh, I'm going to talk to you briefly about the darkening of the Greenland ice sheet. Um, and uh, so the questions that we were trying to ask is: Has Greenland been darkening recently? Uh, what are the causes and drivers, not all of them, of course, uh, and is darkening expected to continue in the future? Uh, darkening, of course, recently has received a lot of attention about uh, the position of soot, black carbon on the ice sheet, but we really think about darkening with a revised definition. There are processes that we know they happen on the snow when it melts and refreezes that causes albedo to decrease. So I'd like you to follow me um, in this little journey about snow physics beside the suit and uh, uh, deposition, they, will drive, they are driving also the darkening of the ice sheet. First thing's results, uh, this, uh, this scheme, uh, this plot is showing you uh, the albedo summer um, uh, over the entire average over the entire Greenland ice sheet between 1981 and 2012. Uh, you uh, probably are familiar with results starting in 2000 when the MODIS sensor was launched, but we extended the really time series before, and we found that darkening, which is basically reduction of albedo, uh, is uh, started around 1996 and has been accelerating until 2012. The data we have is also 2013 and 14, but the analysis we provided was until 2012 when we did that work. Uh, this corresponds the same year when there was also beginning of a warming of the Greenland ice sheet of, of about 0.74 Celsius per decade. Um, so 
we uh, so this is what uh, we find out with the extended analysis of the remote sensing data. But so we we came up with three hypotheses that are tried to explain, and they are explain ninety percent actually of the variability of the albedo that we saw. First one is uh, extensively and persistently increased surface uh, surface no grain size. Uh, and I'll walk you through these three uh, items very, very quickly. The exposure of bare ice, and of course the impurities concentrations, uh, we think due to meltwater consolidation and the associated biological activity. Uh, so why do we care about green size? So in a, in a nutshell, really when you have new snow is very bright, uh, and as you go through melting and refreezing cycles, the grains get bigger and bigger. Now, this creates a reduction in albedo, but as you see in my last point, this is really invisible to our eyes. We don't see changing the color because this effect happens in a, in a wavelength that is not visible to our eyes. So the snowpack might be, look very bright to us, uh, to us, but still absorbs a lot of more solar radiation because of the changes that we cannot see. Uh, and because melting has been increasing, the grain size has been uh, growing faster and faster, and the albedo has been reducing faster and faster, so this is one of the causes of darkening. The second is, of course, the exposure of bare ice. The snow is bright again, ice is much darker than snow. As you melt more and more snow that is deposited every year, or the seasonal from previous years, because again of increased melting, you do expose more bare ice. Bare ice might contain or not impurities, but overall, the snow has a new snow is about 80% albedo. Uh, bare ice is about 40% albedo, 30% depending on the kind of ice. So you really reduce a lot albedo. Again, in this case, melting, excessive melting, enhanced melting is creating uh, an increased uh, reduction in albedo because of exposure of bare ice. And last thing is, of course, impurities concentrations. Now. One thing that happens, as you can imagine, impurities are embedded in the snowpack. They are really transported to the atmosphere, they sit there, but they are within the snowpack, just not on the surface. As you melt the snow, the more you melt it, the snow acts as a filter, and the impurities, uh, part of the impurities is left on the surface because it's not washed away. And so what happens is that the more melting you have, the more impurities you deposit on the surface, not because they are coming from forest fires or not because they are coming from atmosphere, uh, but because you basically had a, a, have a cumulative effect of all the impurities that were stored in the snowpack during the previous years or decades are released because of the uh, increased melting from uh, uh, the, uh, the, the that is uh, that we observed over the past years. Uh, we did not find any evidence of increased uh, deposition of impurities from the atmosphere of forest fires again on a seasonal scale, but again we think that the cumulative effect is more important than the single season effect because of the melting uh, is accumulating more uh, impurities on the surface uh, because of the uh, meltwater uh, consolidation, which is also called somehow scavenging. Uh, we projected also uh, the albedo trends using different IPCC scenarios uh, and different CO2 scenarios by 2100 using a model that does not account for impurities, but only for grain size changes and uh, the uh, exposure of bare ice. And all the models consistently point out to a darkening of the, uh, of the ice sheet in the future. Uh, and these uh, projections are very likely underestimated because we're working to incorporate the effect of impurities, both from the atmosphere and from the uh, meltwater consolidation effect into our models. And this is likely gonna change the uh, order of uh, the, uh, the trend of the uh, ODL uh, decrease. Uh, this is a summary. Uh, you have a slides for your reading. Um, one point that I wanted to came up with, I know that it's always good to have a punchline. And uh, um, so melting is a culprit because it's creating all these changes in the, on the physical processes of snow, but it's also the victim because you know there is this feedback mechanism that is enhancing, uh, the more melt you have, the albedo decreases, grain size are changing, are growing, more bare ice is exposed, you have more impurities, and so melting is important, not only because it drives a lot of the water that is contributing to sea level rise, but because it's also impacting all these surface processes, and most importantly, albedo, which is the driver of the surface processes during the summer, and it amplifies the effect of, uh, of the warming temperatures over Greenland. And I'm concluding with this slide. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your presentations. We'll now open the floor for questions. If anyone here in the room or those watching remotely want to ask, you're welcome to. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Odd Pilström. I'm a freelance journalist from Norway. Uh, if you sum up all the drivers, uh, temperature, clouds, uh, sooth, everything, what is the most probable projection for uh, sea level rise from, uh, from the uh, Greenland ice shield? Uh, and mel total melting in terms of cubic uh, kilometers. Uh, today, as, an, uh, as an, I understand, is plus minus three, four hundred cubic kilometers per year. You had a, a top in 2012, reaching over 500 cubic kilometers. But if you extend this a few decades into the future, what will we see? Andy, I think you're, you're probably the IMB. OK, um, so you talked about melting, but Greenland loses ice through surface melting and also through the speed up of glaciers. Uh, nothing has, in terms of assessments of the ice losses from Greenland into the future and today, nothing has changed since the time of the, the, the fifth assessment report. And so the, the, the simulations that were made then are the ones that we would uh, rely on today as well. There is no new physics being incorporated into the projection, the models that are used that form the basis of projections um, at the moment. And so nothing has changed. So, so uh, 40 to 60 centimetres of sea level rise in total from, from all of the uh, different various sources from the ice sheets. It's a small con contribution. It's estimated to be very small for glacier dynamics, but uh, surface melting is, is expected to be two thirds of the ice loss from Greenland throughout the next century. So, but the IPCC, uh, they, <coughs> they has, uh, s uh, seems to be a bit uh, conservative, uh, but that is not the case in your view. Well, uh, the. the, the the IPCC has to be conservative when uh, there's a, a, an absence of uh, information in the scientific domain as to how to treat processes that have been witnessed but not incorporated into the model projections. And there are some processes that drive uh, ice sheet imbalance that we know about because we can see them in the satellite measurements and we can understand them from a physical basis, but we can't build ice sheet models that are able to simulate them today. And so we have to make some estimate or guess, guesstimate, as to what those processes could do in the future. And that's why people would say there's a potential conservative uh, side to those sea level projections, because they don't include ice dynamical imbalance. The, the processes that you started to talk about were surface mass balance. That's much better understood. It's pretty clear how changes in the amount of uh, heat delivered from the atmosphere can, can, can affect the ice sheet, except for the processes that we, the three of us have talked about today. So generally speaking, if you warm up an ice cube, it will melt at a normal rate. But then if you put an ice, uh, a cloud in front of it, that will change it. If you cause a lake to form on the surface of it, that will change it. And if you darken the surface, that will change it. So all of these three processes will adjust the surface mass balance as well of the ice sheet. So there's still room for improvement in the, in the ice sheet projections. I don't speculate, sorry. Well, I, if you are... Just a, a follow-up question. Uh, Konrad Steffen, which is a very famous uh, uh, ice sheet researcher. He's a very famous ice sheet researcher, yeah. He said in uh, the Geo Cinema here that uh, there was uh, a sea level rise. If, if all the ice from Greenland that disappeared, it would be, represent five to six meters. But the, the figure there, there's all, always is seven meters. So is there an, uh, a, a new figure now? Or? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to hog this. So the, the, these and guys are glaciologists as well. But, the, but it's a question of time. So if you took all of the ice off the Greenland ice sheet and put it into the oceans today, it would cause a certain amount of sea level rise. And then over time, the Earth would re respond. It would rebound because the ice sheet is less of, presents less of a load. The oceans would cool down, and that would spread around the planet. And as time goes by, the oceans adjust and the planet adjusts. And so the total sea level rise, the relative sea level that we would see houses near to the ocean changes. These guys can talk as well. Though. I don't know if you want any other input, but I, I don't think we can take credit or blame for what Connie says. He's a good friend and a colleague, but uh, I think the numbers are, uh, the order of magnitude are correct. I think what we really are uh, discussing at this stage of our uh, research uh, is 
more to look at things from a system point of view. What matters the most is, yes, to identify the single processes and how they uh, impact uh, things melting, uh, ice discharge, but then to look at things, how do you combine? How do they interact with each other? Think about, for example, if I see a darkening, but then there's more clouds where they are stopping the solar radiation to hit, the effect of darkening might be less important in the future than we think it's now because there's less sun hitting the surface, but we don't know yet. So the interaction and between the systems and to look at things from a, a systemic point of view, it is something that is just starting now because there are uh, young uh, people like, you know, Christoph or other people are starting to look at these processes. And, you know, yes, we know Greenland has been there for a while. Glaciology has been working on these things for a while. But they actually, to be honest, the real interest, the real focus, the real acceleration on looking at in detail of these things in a more quantitative way, it started only very recently from, uh, uh, from a research point of view. So we have been doing a lot of progress in a very fast way and uh, putting all together, understanding how the different systems interact with each other. That's the real trick. That's what's gonna drive your linear or acceleration or your cubic or whatever is gonna be your uh, future trend. We have an idea, we have our own speculations, but we like not to share them because there are no signs and we like to deliver to you what we think it's more reliable for us. So uh, what I would say, just, just to add to that point about how much ice there is in Greenland, there was a really nice paper last year by, by Matthew Morgan who um, reassessed the shape of the Greenland ice sheet. And you can do this with a numerical model. We don't have a perfect map of the bed topography underneath Greenland, so we don't really know exactly how big it is. We can tell you how much it's changing from measurements of the surface or how fast it's flowing, but that total number, the total amount of sea level potential, depends on a complete survey of the basement of the ice. And, and that was, there, was a, there was a study done last year, so maybe, maybe I wasn't here when Connie was talking, but maybe he was referring to that. It's a revision of the basement topography, which gives us a, a better handle on the volume of ice, and so we would expect a different number for the total volume of ice. There's a question from the chat for Marco. Um, Robert McSweeney from Carbon Brief asks, have you estimated the amount of ice loss that darkening is responsible for? Not yet, because um, there are some limitations to uh, quantify the direct contribution from the uh, black carbon from other impurities on the darkening. And the reason is there is a big lack of ground in situ measurements uh, on the ice sheet to understand how much of the um, darker material con is basically uh, due to black carbon soot uh, or dust. Uh, and also because um, there is also remote sensing does not allow us to separate the effect of these three components. Plus, during the summer, as you do have a more um, darker black carbon, you do develop also uh, bacteria and algae that in turn make you know, the surface darker and they do have a different spectral component. Uh, so it is really a very dynamic environment. Um, the, the systems are called cryoconite, and there are little holes that contain this dark material that sink into these holes, and life you know, starts there. That's actually the only life form on the ice sheet, which is very close to some of the uh, exoplanet life uh, models that people are thinking about it. But because things evolve uh, in a very dynamic way, and you know, life and this bacteria and algae can be pretty dark, they add to that. Uh, again, having the models that account for uh, the presence of these impurities will allow us to separate the contribution from a warming Greenland versus a darkening, and then we can start partitioning the forcing uh, to, the, to the future. Uh, but this is something that uh, is going to come uh, relatively soon in the future. Um, yeah, a, a few questions. Marco, just to, to be clear then, so at the moment you can't separate uh, um, the forcing of the individual darkening effects, all you can say is that the, the surface is getting darker. Yeah, you can't, you can't say uh, the effect of uh, exposed ice is a, is a bigger effect than, um, you know, uh, the concentration of impurities on the surface. I mean... Well, yes and no. 
Uh, yes, because you know of what just I said, but depending on where you look in Greenland, uh, for higher elevations, uh, well, first of all, the concentration of impurities in Greenland with respect to the rest of the Arctic is relatively small, and the effect of grain size evolution, given also the increase of melting, uh, of what we know concentrations are in Greenland is much stronger on a seasonal scale than the uh, effect of impurities due to the atmospheric deposition. The bare ice exposed also on the west coast of Greenland contains some dust and dark material that is not coming very likely from the atmosphere, but it's basically a dark ice that is outcropped from the bottom because it contains moraine or some other materials that was stored there by the ice, and it's now surfacing on the ice. So that source is not, uh, it's known, but it's not quantifiable. So when, and that uh, it's known as a dark band. Uh, but, and, and of course, then you have the meltwater uh, effect. Uh, I will say that along the ages of Greenland, the impact of surface impurities can be very high and can be as high, if not higher, than the grain size change and comparable to the effect of the bare ice. As you move at higher elevations, the grain size effect, and I do have, I think, maps in my supplementary, I don't know if they were included, but as you move at higher elevations, because you have less concentrations of impurities, less concentration of impurities, because also the impurities come from local eroded material uh, areas, uh, then uh, the grain size effect is for sure dominating, uh, when I say for sure, according to what I see, dominating the uh, overall effect. And that is one of the, uh, it's mostly driven by, of course, the increase in melting cycles. Uh, and, is, and melting, you should probably, uh, you are very much aware of this, but has been going, uh, lasting longer, starting earlier, and, uh, and going at higher elevations on average over the past you know, 15, 20 years. And this implies that you have larger grains exposed on the surface for longer periods. And that is actually what is driving uh, the um, albedo effect from a grain size point of view. And, and Andy, can you, can you uh, just again summarize for me where the thinking is on the importance of um, uh, basal lubrication? So I mean, there's, there's this view, isn't there, that, that actually the important thing for Greenland is, is what the ocean is doing uh, with these big outlet glaciers. That's kind of, um, you know, where the big changes might, might be taking or the big, um, uh, the big losses uh, may be occurring. So where, how, how important is this, this, you know, this, this water going down uh, to the surface and, and speeding up the movement of, uh, of the ice? So, um, um the numbers are at the fourth assessment report, IPCC, an estimate, and it was admittedly a first estimate because it was only just discovered that this thing could happen, uh, was that there could be an extra 18 centimetres of sea level rise as a consequence of this. And there was a, a lot of work done on that over the past five years. And the fifth assessment report, a paper by Shannon et al. last year, or in 2013, I forget which, um, and when it came out, uh, put the number very, very much lower, down at less than one centimetre of sea level rise, because they, uh, they simulated the effects of the lakes that were there today. So it's somewhere between those two numbers. We don't know, is the answer. Um, there was a paper recently by Jockey Natal, uh, Jockey and others, um, I forget, uh, Poynar, I think was the author, which said that the current speed at which the ice flows in Greenland would also limit uh, the ability of lakes, should they form, to fracture through the ice. Because what happens is the lake might fill with water, but the ice has to then fracture, and depending on how fast the ice moves and spreads apart, strains, uh, that can keep those fractures open and allow water to get to the base. So this is another factor that has to be taken into account. So I think the important story is that, um, the important information is that the models that uh, we had confidence in five years ago need to be revised again, and this is what happens with science, unfortunately. You, see, you find things out, you think you've solved the problem, but you haven't. So when we look at the northeast of Greenland now, uh, we see uh, a glacier that's speeding up um, in a very different way to we ever thought it might do. We don't know why that is. It could be ocean warming, and it could be uh, associated with the surface melting that's gone on in that area as well. It might be just one warm summer, might not be. Elsewhere in the Arctic, uh, at Ausfonner Ice Cap, we see a glacier that's flowing 50 times faster now than it was two years ago. And people think 
that's a large glacier. It's a marine-based glacier. People think, actually, it's a link between the two things. We think it, the story is that some melting happened at the surface, triggered the glacier to surge forwards, and that's triggered an internal surge mechanism, which is now keeping the ice flowing very much faster. So these, two, these things could all be quite tightly linked. Um, and so any numerical model for future sea level rise has to be able to include, include all the processes, and they don't right now. Thank you very much. Do we have any additional questions? Lewis Collins, Editor at Niche Communications. Just building on the last question there, as these supraglacial lakes move inland, mm -hmm. do you have any idea um, how the characteristics change? Will they be larger, smaller, and are they less likely or more likely to drain through the ice street sheets? Again, is this do the, the dynamics different in terms of these um, fissures or cracks in the ice sheet the closer you go to the summit? The, uh, the shape of them will change because the terrain gets less steep and so uh, the ponds will be larger. Uh, so they'll contain more water. Uh, but conversely, they'll be thinner and so uh, they may not uh, uh, be strong enough to fracture the ice in the same way that they, they are further downstream. don't know. Uh, it's also important uh, to understand uh, what the surface of the ice sheet is like at those altitudes as well, higher up. If you walk around on Greenland, I haven't. These guys probably have. Uh, some of you might have. Um, if you walk around the edge, it's, it's bare ice, and, and that thing stuff just melts off and runs away. But as you get higher and higher up, you've got quite a thick layer of something that's between snow and ice, and any water that might appear on the surface is going to change the structure of the surface as well. And so it's quite a complicated problem uh, as to, to, to how the water might actually pond and change the surface of the ice sheet farther inland. Um, and uh, it's quite a lot of work, actually, for somebody to solve that. Thank you. We have. Uh, going uh, briefly back to the two, 2012 uh, melt event, mm -hmm. uh, which was, uh, as I read, uh, right up to the summit, 90, some 97 percent of the surface was melting. What was uh, uh, is there understanding of what was the main drivers uh, of that uh, period of that uh, event? Was it linked to, uh, for instance? Uh, 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 record minimum of uh, the sea ice uh, that year. I, I don't think it was. I mean, it's related to the record minimum of sea ice, but my, uh, this is a separate word. <coughs> Our understanding is that it drove also the record minimum of sea ice. We think that sea ice is strongly driven by uh, the uh, uh, the temperature of the air. So several things affect sea ice. The, the speeds of the winds cause it to drift and pack together sometimes. Mm -hmm. The amount of snow that falls affects it, and the, the warm air temperatures affect it as well. It's almost certainly the case that the record melt extent of Greenland was associated with a very uh, high-pressure system, prolonged high-pressure system, atmospheric systems. I don't understand the, the, the origins of that circulation pattern, but it also affected the sea ice in the, in the Arctic as well. Well, I, I can add something, unless Chris wanted I can only add also add you something, but I think it's okay. a combination so, of your work and mine. Right, so you know, one of the things that we, there have been many studies trying to address the 2012 melt extent. Um, besides the fact that I think melt extent in 2012 was important because it was spectacular, but what I think it took the scene from the fact also that melting was the highest on record in terms of runoff and total melt, uh, which, yes, it's important to have the idea that melt was extending all over, the water refers there, but 2012 was also the year when more water in absolute in record was produced over the entire ice sheet. And you know we named it the Goliath year, just because if you plot stuff, it stands so high compared to other years that it really uh, was exceptional. Um, there were, the, between 96 and about 2012, there were uh, summer conditions that were favoring the warm air from the south to continuously every summer contribute to the trend of warming, and part of the air might have been climbing up you know, to, the, uh, to the top of the ice sheet, contributing to the, um, to the melting, of course. People have been looking, of course, at clouds, uh, other processes. Uh, again, I really like the idea of combination of processes. You have to see like a delicate dance, and every, every Piece is important, you know, the music, the dancers, the crowd, everything has a balance. And so when you look at this kind of processes, you really need to think that there's no one answer. But the fact that colleagues and, you know, we were able to identify different sources and put them 
um, in, in to all together, I think it's a big, big uh, plus compared to previous years um, because that tells a lot about the progresses of the communities that the community is doing over the past years. And I'll let Christoph finish. Yeah, I think that's referring back to the, the to the first question. I mean, it's it's so difficult to get a proper estimate of what the I sheet will do in the future because there's so many complex interplays between so many different uh, processes. And it was indeed then that that, that high pressure system and 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 warm and moist air came in from the south and. Um, but if it would have only been the temperature or the moist air, then there would probably have been no melt, no no zero degrees at summit. Um, there was a study by Ralph Bernards and colleagues that showed that it was actually because of a particular type of clouds over summit that in combination with the high temperature and moist air um, got that surface temperature to zero degrees. It means that if that cloud were there, but the warm air temperature was not, then we wouldn't have that perfect recipe to to get this extreme melt event. And yeah, we we, we only can look at the uh, uh, at the, the separate processes, try to understand them, and then indeed the most difficult part is where we just have been starting with uh, try to couple all these systems together and try to get them right in the models to see what the likeliness is to get such events in the future again. So. And I think this is the effect you're referring to, right? Yes. Okay. One of the effects. Okay. <laughs> Just, just to, to illustrate the, the, the implications of like these one-off events, the melt event that happened across the whole of Greenland leaves a permanent layer now in the ice as it's moving down, and some more snow might pile on top of it, but actually this is like a, a blocking layer, so any further water melting that happens might never get through that layer, and it'll just stick there and get and solidify, so actually it changes the structure of the ice sheet effectively permanently. Uh, over decadal time scales, so that we have to revise our assessments of how water might then travel and percolate through the ice. There's a question in the chat for Marco from Robert McSweeney, uh, Carbon Brief. Uh, he asks, could you explain the different color lines or areas on your projected darkening through 2100 graph? Sure, and I apologize for that. Uh, there was in the presentation and I... Um, okay. So, okay, uh, I'm not a graphic designer, so I do my best. But um, the the line, the black line, is what we simulate with our model using forcing by analysis data. The red line is the output from the the measurements from the satellite. You can see 2012 is basically is the last point we have, and it's really deep in now. The three colors, the green, blue, and red, are simulations from the model that we use, which is the same model that produces the black line, but using uh, different Earth system model uh, future projections. So we use the climate simulated by these models, and we simulate the albedo over Greenland with these outputs. Uh, the top and the bottom of each colored area is the, uh, is the re output in the case of 850 parts per million of CO2, so the, it's also known as RCP45, and the bottom lines are the RCP85, and they are slightly semi-transparent to allow, to allow overlapping. So wherever you see the brown, basically, is where the three outputs are um, overlapping. The dark green is where the blue and the light green uh, so the Canadian and the uh, Miroc model are overlapping. And of course, the purple is the red and the blue overlapping. Uh, bottom line, you see that in the RCP85, which is the very, uh, you know, it's the highest scenario for CO2 projection, uh, the, uh, all the models are, point, in general, all the models are pointing out to darkening, but of course, the ones with less CO2 uh, to a less darkening and the ones with higher CO2 by the end of 2100 to a, dar to a more pronounced darkening. Uh, I'll be happy to provide a copy of this with uh, with a caption. Uh, it's part of the presentation we had. It's part of the draft of the paper we submitted. So um, anybody can contact me for this. And I apologize for not having been able to explain this within six minutes. Thank you. We have time for one more question, if there is one. Okay, if there isn't, then we'll finish here. And we are done here at the Press Center for the week. Uh, but you are welcome to attend the great debate today at 3.30 in room Y1 on negotiating climate policy. 
And I hope to see you again next year. We are, will be here in Vienna from the 17th to the 22nd of April. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very much for your excellent presentations. Thank you. Bye-bye.